point uh honorable clayton obun is on the line to join us in this discussion about the recent devastating Brno flooding hello and good morning honorable clayton good morning for having me this morning it's always a pleasure to have you join us on the program well, very quickly, uh, in the news this morning, we saw that the debt toll has risen to about 259 in 172 local government areas across states that have been affected by flooding in the country. But now let's narrow it down to Brno State, where the most devastating one has occurred following the collapse of the Allowed Dam. Let me get your reaction to this uh, very, very damning and devastating incident in the state. Let me first react by uh, sending my very deep sympathies to the people of Brno State, to their governor, Zulum, who have been doing so much for the people, and to also thank the Nigerian military for once again demonstrating that they are one of the best, not only on the African continent, but in the world. By coming to the rescue and by the response of the government and government officials, and uh, it shows that Nigeria can indeed work. Borno is a perfect example and indeed a renewed hope for our country. We wish the vice president, the governor, the military, and everybody is at once galvanized and mobilized to meet with the community and make the people feel that they are indeed part of one Nigeria. It is for that reason that I send my sympathy by calling on all Nigerians to once again see our common humanity and our nationhood building up. But it is so sympathetic also that despite all efforts to make our country work, the enemies of the country, those who think that this country should not work so that they can get murdered abroad, will not engage in activities that will avoid this type of natural disasters. Number one, flooding is not peculiar to Nigeria. Number two, the response to it should not be to blame anybody for it. Most of the time, we have the human factor. When man obstructs nature, we will get to understand that God forgives all the time, man forgives sometimes, but nature never forgives. So we, we will go blocking drainages, we will go building in, in, in waterways, we will go desiccating the forest and breaking down systems and ecosystems which should be ready for the repercussions of nature no matter how long it takes. That is the lesson in Maru within the lecture basin. The water flooding and all that is happening today is predictable because we have disrupted so much of it that it has become impossible for us to sustain it and be able to withstand the anger and response of nature to our carelessness and our wickedness to our own environment. Well, well, well Honorable Obun, uh, recently reports also poured in that Prior to the allowed dam collapse, uh, a lot of concerns were raised, especially to the state government uh, and the state emergency management agency to take action and fix the cracks that were seen uh, along the lines of the dam. But these, uh, these concerns or these alarms were just swept under the carpet. And just a few days after these alarms were raised, uh, the, the dam collapsed and uh, we now see what the people of Maiduguri are faced with, which has cost the lives of uh, scores of people. Many people have been displaced. Almost a million people have been displaced and are in IDP camps right now. Uh, who do you think perhaps should have been held responsible uh, for this negligence? First of all, the inland waterways system of our country, especially as it regards to response to alarm, because we keep insisting that there are no repercussions for crimes, especially when death is, okay, is it occasions death. When death occurs on account of this human negligence, this negligence, especially in this case, in which there should be repercussions. People must lose their jobs. Death must go. People should go to prison. People should be sentenced to life in prison because lives are lost. Fathers are suffering, like you have pointed out, whether by IDP camps are displaced on account of the carelessness and negligence of somebody who is being paid by government to undertake the protection of water for the purpose of harming 
and for those that have avoided disasters of this nature. When somebody and some people are in an organization, the heads in that area, those who head those areas, must be made to pay for it. First, by losing their jobs, and two, losing everything that they have gotten. That is to say, they should live without pension or gratuity, so that they will know what it means to make those people lose their farmlands, lose their houses, and lose their, their loved ones. Parents are being lost, children are being lost, farmlands are being lost, residences are being lost. And then one person sits there and thinks that his duty is just to collect salary and make money to do work with it. That level of, we are seeing that happen in all our sectors. In education, just to get an approval is a problem. Just to get release of funds that are ready in government coffers is a problem. And an entire generation of people are not going to school on account of that level of carelessness. These are the things we are referring to, and for which government must take serious action to make people pay for negligence for being employed. You seek employment, you seek promotion, you seek to exhibit your expertise and to work for a fatherland on a patriotic basis. And you go ahead, you are shown that this war will soon collapse. This dam and its collapse is going to affect life, it's going to affect an entire country. And then you go back and sleep and wake up and now want to do disaster management, preventable disaster. You are now pretending that you want to go and do it. When that happened, when that indication was given, when the alarm was raised by the necessary authority, those who refuse to act should be made to pay. They should be prosecuted. So we don't do that. When they are prosecuted, now people will jump up and say, because they are Hausa, because they are Fulani, because they are Kanuri, because they are Muslim, because they are Christian. They will not talk about their negligence. And the effect it has on a great majority of vulnerable people, innocent people, who pay their taxes for you to protect them just by preparing a dam and making sure that it doesn't collapse. Those people should be prosecuted. And we are the civil society organization. We want to see Sarah go to court on this matter. We want to see Amnesty International come out to talk about this. These are here, real and visible and traceable acts of negligence in governmental terms. And government must take responsibility for the irresponsibility of this kind of human being who sit down and do nothing but to pain, sorrow, and death on their fellow citizens. Now, Honorable Obun, let's also look at some of the issues concerning the proactiveness on the part of the government. We now look at a projection as published by The Guardian that would take 12 years with over 762 million naira to repair the collapsed Alao Dam. And people keep asking that we had projects on ground to build counter dams, both to prevent against the overflooding of the Lagdo down in Cameroon and now the Alao Dam. Uh, how do we follow up to ensure that these projects are implemented as uh, environmentalists, much like yourselves, who have warned about the devastating impacts of altering ecosystems? The first thing to do is, even in medicine, in medical terms, preventive medicine is evoked now. It is no longer curative medicine. So where we are now is to do prevention. And what do you do? Afforestation is the first step. Reclamation is the second step. Because if you like this, ten more than As long as the environmental conditions are not set, to sustain those dams and to contain the water, the volume of water that is going to come up. Because without a forestation program and the encroachment of the desert and the total conversion to Sahel Savannah, we are bound to get on a yearly basis to continue to have a recurrence of this collapse dam because the volume of water getting into those dams was never anticipated. At the time of building those dams, the volume of rainfall in centimeters was not as much as we have today, where we have destroyed the entire forest, where the gaseous emissions from human action of vehicular transport, generators, air travel, and of course, man's activity in terms of seeking energy through wood and cutting down wood to survive because of the price of gas, petrol, and kerosene. You are bound to have the continuous attack on the forest, right from the uh, the, the forest of Bumaji, Daniel Reboki, up to Akanka, Oban, Ndiriji, down there. All those areas which houses the last Congolian rainforest in the West African sub-region, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is bound to have effect 
also in the far north, where the shrubs and what you call the, the, the forest, you talk about some bitter forest. There's no forest anywhere there. Those shrubs are not totally forest. The definition of forest is being reversed in Nigeria. So we need an affectation, an aggressive affectation program to the reconstruction of those dams, which is not going to be done overnight. So you need to have the trees will grow overnight. So we need to have, of course, there are species of trees that can even get up. If you get to the Israeli, Israeli Ministry of Agriculture and Green, you will discover that there are trees that we can even put there that will be able to sustain the kind and compact the soil surfaces in that area, which are mostly desert. So for me, the first thing to do is to start a heavy afforestation program within that area and to, to get our military. But the military is now overstretched. In peace time, we would have said the military engineering department can be redeployed to that area. But again, we can get volunteers. We are talking about unemployment. There are several engineers that today are underutilized, potentially given that they are, they are building engineering departments that exist all over our polytechnics, our universities, and our universities of technology. Why are we not deploying the final year students, deploying this practical area for them to go and now to the, ministry, the, the Department of Agriculture in the university? The unemployment market is saturated. Why can't we take these people and make them volunteers and government pay them and then deploy them to the north and to those other areas that have this? We have a neighborhood. The NYC camps are bubbling. We are keeping some young people not going to youth service because we say the camps will be busting with people. Nigeria must deploy. If you ask them million to go and put a down, why won't you use that money and deploy to young people to come in here and volunteer to do that job? and stay there and also be useful to the country. So from the NYC to the universities, to the lecturers, to the unemployed in the market, if you deploy them there, we have enough hands to attack and remedy and uh, 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 arrange and get what we might call a remediation, even if it's an intermediate, intermediate point for us to deal with uh, the situation as we have find today. Nigeria is not lacking in manpower. Nigeria is not lacking in materials, men and materials to keep itself safe from this type of natural disaster. The tsunamis and all kinds of hurricanes in America, Canada, and other places that have even shut down their public life, especially public writing system, have been contained. We can also do that here, just like the military and the civil defense and others have done in the Northeast in the case of Medugri that just happened a few days ago. I think we are able and we can, and we have the capacity and potential to be able to contain this disaster. Well, Honorable Obun, you earlier mentioned reafforestation as a way of uh, mitigating this intense climate change that is perhaps causing flooding in most in most parts of the country. Now, some people would argue that maybe the breed of seeds that we have now do not really thrive so well in northern Nigeria without the use of fertilizers. In the past, people could throw seeds on the ground when rain when when the rains fall. Uh, these seeds germinate on their own without any care or any form of human interference. But these days, it's like fertilizer is the order of the day for most people, especially in the northern region of the country. Uh, what do you make of this? And how can we uh, regain our old seeds that sort of grow naturally on their own without human interference? Now, we are dealing now with the area of agriculture, sustainable agriculture, and modern agriculture, and organic farming, unlike the irrigation system that were there before. Now, the allegation being made, the suspicion is that the use of fertilizer has weakened the soil profile, so that its compactness has been moving up by the use of chemicals, especially herbicides and fertilizers. Fertilizer cannot weaken soil surfaces. What we look at soil surfaces are the chemicals used for, like herbicides, like insecticides, and such other things. That's what we can do. So, an excessive use of the land so that crop rotation is no longer there, but constant use of the same soil over time, weakening it. But for each time you go to a farm, you are taking out the grasses, you are taking out the trees. And of course, that again exposes the soil surfaces to the Vigaries of weather, sun and rain, sun and rain year in year, as January to December every year. This is the source by which I now mean that a forestation program, an aggressive afforestation program, will arrest 
there are certain types of plants that can recover because even by their very leaves that drop, they form the manure that we are talking about. In southern Nigeria, especially in our forest area, as I speak to you, in 2024, the, in, in the entire of land, which has some of the best forests you can get, in, especially in the forest belt, stretching from the Buru Kakin Ranch down to Akanko, a child of 30, 35, 40 years does not know what fertilizer looks like unless he goes to school and they teach him fertilizer. He doesn't know what fertilizer looks like. In 2024, this is 13th of, 13th of September so, 2024. Yes. Fertilizer has never been used in any part of my community. It's covering over 20,000, 20 square kilometers. What, 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 you, what would you attribute this to? So what we are saying is that fertilizers in the north could not have become a major source of soil desiccation. It cannot loosen the soil. Yes. That is not the truth. Yes, the, the fertility of the soil is affected because of what I have already told you about. That is the heavy afforestation program and the repeated use of family, farming. This kind of farming that does not allow for recovery of soil fertility. Now, you need to have a, a forestation program will do that double job. First of retaining the soil and two, refertilizing the soil without organic material like fertilizers. So in that way, you are first of all getting shelter and corn canopy for the soil and for the crops and recovering the fertility of the same soil with the leaves that drop from those trees. So in that way, you are again recovering the soil and returning to what you are asking for. So there are modern trees, there are modern ways of replanting and afforestation that can recover the soil in several of kilometers and several areas, but this is what a large landscape. And coming from the Chad Basin and the Lake Chad around the Baga area, where heavy fishing is taking place, there is no reason why we cannot have a forestation program with damming and, of course, uh, irrigation working there. Irrigation has always worked there. I have lived around the Benishek area, around the Babangida area, around the Dapchi area, going to, to Gaida. You can have your irrigation there with those little streams and get your water without running yourself into trouble. Between Desha and Potisco, between Katagum and Bombay Town, those areas, even down to Medugri, between Bama, Goza, you are not going to have those kind of areas that uh, 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 will, will give you problems in terms of getting irrigation to do afforestation. We have enough potential and enough material. The College of Education in Goza now, which has been there, how are they going to survive in the place is not sustainable? There's a new College of Education established by the last administration. So for me, I imagine that fertilizer or no fertilizer and a forestation program, a forestation program with, combined with irrigation will definitely make life easy for the community and it brings, it brings at once employment and changes the economic lifestyle because now that the Boko Haram and the banditry activities in that area have been sufficiently changed and reduced grossly. There is, yesterday I was just watching people returning to their communities on NTA where people are now returning to their normal home state, meaning that normal life is returning to those areas. You can introduce this as an activity that can even keep the community on and bring in even visitors to teach the community on how to sustain itself using this uh, old agricultural method but with modern introductions. All right, Honorable, thank you. Let's now move on to another issue in the news captured on two papers as we highlighted earlier, the Matrix and the first newspaper that looks at discussions between local marketers, Dangote Refinery, and the position of the NNPCL in product pricing. Now, reported by these two papers, marketers are looking to boycott Dangote over what many would not really understand, as they're saying that the diesel sold by the refinery is cheaper than other alternatives imported into the country at 900 naira per liter. Now, an NNPC is asking for a sustained presence at the refinery whilst these price discussions are ongoing. It's becoming quite challenging that whilst Nigerians are looking for respite in cheaper petroleum products coming from Dangote refinery that is to be sold in Naira, the position of marketers now is becoming a big challenge with the NNPCL's hands almost seemingly strong according to these price models that we expected. What's your position on this development, sir? 
my position has not changed about the role of NMPC, all their subsidiaries and all their departments and whatever they are doing. That is a huge monster ready to destroy this country. Unless it is dismantled, it has become a striking star monster. We best NMCC to regulate and give us fuel at the cheapest which God has given us under our soil. We are not importing anything. Dangote is producing on being so in Naira. I do not understand why the same NMPC is becoming so bewitching. It has become so bewitching that then it is now trying to stifle Dangote from operations and from giving to Nigerians because once we saw Dangote coming, the first impulse of the Nigerian man was that with fuel now being produced in Nigeria, refined in Nigeria and sold in the Nigerian market, we are now going to have a reduction. And Dangote demonstrated that with diesel coming from 1,200, 1,300 to 900. And now we are expecting that fuel will also drop, come down from 817, 817 naira, where Dangote was, 617 naira rather, which Dangote was selling, I mean the NMPC was selling, that they will now return us to about 400, out of 400 and 300 naira. What do we get instead? NMPC is doing everything to ensure that Nigeria must continue to suffer. Two things must give way now. And I want to see the civil societies and MLC and TUC and all their agencies coming out to stand their food and ask this president to tell us to choose between NMPC making money for a few or reducing prices for a majority of Nigerians to survive. APC promised and is still built on a mantra and manifesto of welfareism. We therefore owe it a duty to Nigerians to protect them. The profiteering tendencies of MNPC is threatening to make APC government renege on its promise to Nigerians. There is no hope in making money for dead people. The purpose of making more money for Nigeria is to provide the best for people. But if they, it, it has been reversed to a point where more people must die so that people will be alive to enjoy themselves over Nigeria's wealth given by God, then we have to rethink about what we are asking for. Well, this well, is completely intolerable, unacceptable, and must be rejected by Nigerians. Well, and well, 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 must well, explain well, to us the kind of economy, the kind of economy they want to operate. In which they told us before now that they want market forces to determine the price of petroleum. And because they were importing refined products while exporting crude, now we are refining crude. At the time, they told us that the landing cost, now Dangote is landing from where? From Lagos to Abuja, from Lagos to Calabar. What is the landing cost they are talking about? They want to, they have to school us on this. We cannot understand this economy in which Dangote now comes to refine the fuel they were refining abroad. And we are telling us that the price will become even more expensive than it was when we were importing the fine product. Before now, the story NFT to wove around us was that it was costing them so much to bring back the refined oil. And therefore, they have even sold the oil up front. Now they are selling to Dangote, and they are telling that there is no proof to give to Dangote. What do they want us to believe now? Where is the exchange program that the exchange of dollar is from which source? If they are selling to Dangote Naira, is Dangote now refining in dollar? What is the problem? Let you tell us the link between the exchange rate in the dollar and what dollar has to do with crude oil given to Dangote in Naira and tell us how Dangote refining oil in Lagos becomes gives us landing cost. Landing from which moon? Landing from which country? To which spot? <laughs> well, 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 Honorable Obun, in as much as we are knocking NNPCL on the head uh, for the impediments that they are forestalling for Nigerians and uh, the Langote refinery, we should also look at the issue of the local oil marketers who are choosing to import refined products at a higher cost other than buying from Langote refinery at a lower cost. And, and reports say that they are probably or they are allegedly uh, deliberate on blocking Langote refineries' operations. If the NNPCL has its own issue on one hand, how do we address the issue of these local marketers 
who are also impeding the progress of the oil sector in the country? Now, let me tell you, those things will function. What is the function of LMP? It's a regulator. So what are they regulating? If anybody can jump up and go and import anything, I mean, did we not in this country find a situation in which we discover that we are doting our local market when we ask that and for other states to produce rice? What did the government do? It shut down all the borders and said, don't bring this. Now that we discovered we are into food crisis on account of security crisis and other challenges, they opened the borders back. So what is difficult by telling these people that you can't bring imported oil into Nigeria? It, it, which market on earth is free? Show me the free market you know in the world. Let me hear. What is America doing with Chinese goods and products? What is America doing with that? We copy our democracy from America. What is America doing with Chinese goods in the international market? So why is our own difference? What did you do in 1975 with Monica Mohammed? Under the expropriation act, when we took Shell, Shell to become a Nigerian national oil production company. Why are we not doing that with the marketers? Why are the marketers? Are they above Nigeria? If we don't want them in Nigeria, I say that that would say no to oppressing Nigeria. What is wrong with that? Do countries not do that? Are we the only country to do that? What, is the what are we talking about regulation? What kind of free market is that? Where did you find that? What kind of economics is that? Is uh, Japan doing that with the mobile industry? Are the Chinese doing that with their, with their, rail, their rail industry? What is Russia doing with its gas? So what kind of free market are we running? We run a cartel here where people use other people's lives as a means of accumulating wealth, wealth on the mind and shortcut others, a greater majority of Nigerians who are vulnerable. Government exists to protect us vulnerable people. Government is not for the rich. Government must take action. NNPC is not above Nigeria. It's not above Nigerians. It's not about this president. And this president must act now. And the Nigerian Senate, the Nigerian National Assembly, I call on the chairman of the Nigerian National Assembly. He is the one who used the right word. That they should investigate the sabotage in the oil industry. It is a clear case of sabotage. The Senate President Senator Papio captured it well and his colleagues in the Senate captured it well. They are now trying to stall it, postponing the investigation and other things. The cartel has switched on its corrupting influences and trying to ensure that that investigation dies and others have died. You want to deal with the, the energy crisis in Nigeria, they will stall it. You want to deal with the fraud crisis in Nigeria, they stall it. Do they want Nigeria to go and see and tell them that we cannot move again until we fix the oil industry, oil and gas industry? This is what I want to see NSC do. To tell NNP we cannot continue to play with the lives of Nigerians. Because the life of Nigerians, the life of, of Nigerians, the drug with which Nigerians bleed and survive on is oil and power. Well, very vehement calls this morning from Honorable Cletus Obun. Uh, Honorable, we have just 10 more minutes and we're hoping we can touch another issue in the news before we let you go. Uh, whilst the NNPC has also looked to suspend new petrol orders owing to a backlog of debt owed to local marketers, attention now shifts to an election less than two weeks away. Come the 21st of September, Edo State would go to the polls. But a ceremony that has been much of a trust builder ahead of elections, which is the signing of a peace accord, has suffered a blow in Edo State as the People's Democratic Party, PDP, has uh, withdrawn from signing that peace accord, despite a visit from former head of state, General Abdusalami Abubakar, uh, we saw the position of Governor Godwin Obaseki and the PDP as regards that peace accord. Now, there have been strong allegations as to where the INEC on the one hand and the CP who has been posted to Edo stands in the election. Uh, do you see any game playing here or are these genuine concerns from the PDP ahead of the elections? PDP has seen defeat and will do everything to give a new foundation to give excuses for its failure. What you are looking here is an escape route. The PDP is ruling a new state through Obaseki. By not signing that peace accord, they have signed an accord for violence. That is the meaning. By not signing a peace accord, they have signed an accord for violence. That is to say, we don't want peace in this election. So if very violence erupts in a new state, the police should not look for anybody. They should look for the PDP and its officials. Because by not signing a peace accord, they have declared that this election must be governed by violence. That is the thing I'm not saying that because the lame excuse of people are being arrested. So anybody 
in the name of election of PDP, where you shoot and kill a policeman in broad daylight, and you turn around and say, those who were cited on the camera on the footage should not be prosecuted because you want to run an election on the corpses of others. You want to dance on the grave of the, 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 the police officer or no? You want to dance on his grave in the name of election? You step on his blood and on his grave and go and dance around and say that the people who did that, you cannot hand them over. A responsible government should say, we are handing them over to investigate the police to leave them on time while the investigation is going on. But they were all being on the run, hiding on the shelter of the governor of, of, of Governor Baseki. And we turn around to start playing around it and say, the red con what is concerned about it? That Onu was not killed, he doesn't have a family, because he wears police uniform, he ceases to be a Nigerian citizen. So he should not be protected, and those who kill him should not be investigated. And we say that those two or three persons who were arrested to come and ask, answer questions. Now we'll store the entire election in a dossier. Do and you will sign a piece of court. They have signed an accord for violence. And the simple answer to that is simply that any violence in the do, a do election, PDP and its officials, including Obaseki, who still with the immunity, will be arrested. We will enjoy immunity until the day of handover. But thereafter, you have nowhere to hide. And we'll get to ask him questions. So for me, if a man like Abdullah, who wanted to fight democracy after Abbas and being the second person to do that, if Hassan Kuka, a respected bishop and intellectual, a theologian, comes to an accord and several other NGOs, and people are mouthing the background, they don't trust them, then it means you even have a thought difficulty for yourself. If you can't trust yourself, why will you trust anybody? So that what you have is what you give. You don't have trust for yourself, why will you trust a, a, a bishop? Why will you trust a, a former head of state who has nothing to lose, he's not contesting the election, he's not looking for any position, he's not a hungry person. So what is he looking for? The international community recognizes him as a champion of democracy. And you sit back here in a small pigeon hole in PDP in a good state and tell the world that you don't trust such people. You are the one lacking in trust. And having declared a war and calling it an election, we shall look at Obaseki and his gang and see what they are going to do in a good state. Well, Honorable, uh, Honorable Obun, do, do you think that perhaps uh, this particular development from the quarters of the PDP in Edo State is as a reflection of the wider internal crisis that has rocked the People's Democratic Party, which has trickled down to the Edo gubernatorial polls? Yeah, yeah you know, PDP is in a pitiable condition. They are lying in a, an intensive care unit of the political theater. And it is our duty as APC, being the government of the day, to give them some shooting ban. And the way to do so is not for them to jump to the center of the stage and begin to dance a macabre dance that they cannot even understand the drama. Because let me come down and waterize and domesticate this. PDP from top to bottom from Port to Lagos, from Osho to Benin, from Bauchi down to down, 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 down to Anambra, down to uh, Enugu State, have had a very, very bad run after the election. Recovery is nearly impossible. They are an irredeemable part of allies who have contrived and connived all along. Now the truth is coming out just like the Labour Party. All those who connive to undermine democracy have been grossly proved wrong that it was an assemblage of strange dead followers who just came for the purpose of election for election. Never because they had anything to do. What I see they do is they kicking the dying steps, the dying steps of a false clay footed giant that paraded and bestrode this country for 16 years and almost ran us aground. The recovery process is on. And once that happens, once light appears, darkness will fade away. And PDP will fade away in like manner, because clearly our reforms in APC may be very hard, but clearly they are better in the long run for this country and for generations to come. PDP is on its way out, and we wish them well, and those who can find their feet and still have the credibility 
we start the democratic train. We sit down here. We will then quarantine them and reorient them to come and shape the democratic process of our country. For now, I think we are wishing them a fast uh, exit from the stage because Obaseki was the last to lead them in a good state. And I think this is the last thing they can ever do. So it's the dying steps, the kicking steps of a dying horse. And there's nothing more we can do to make them recover. This is why we give them a good Christian burial at the end of the elections. All right, Honorable Clayton Zavun, I must thank you so much for uh, these very insightful comments uh, around stories making the rounds in the news from the flooding uh, to the oil and gas crisis and, of course, the uh, issues leading up to the Edo gubernatorial polls come 21st September. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me once again and have a wonderful day. May God bless our fatherland. And and congratulations on your new appointment as uh, chairman of the governing council of the Federal College of Education in Ididep, Akwaibom State as well. It is my duty to serve our sovereign motherland. Thank you.